and we won't we won't show you and we'll try to avoid doing that at all. Okay? Anybody? Yeah? Oh, you you don't? Okay. So you see this one here? Anybody else? Okay, just get a shot at her. No. <laughs> <laughs> And some people don't, and that's that's perfectly all right. All right, so we're launching into chapter one of the text, and uh, it covers the two primary concepts that we're addressing in the class. One is obviously communication, and the other one is culture. So we have different conceptions of culture, and we have a model of communication that's going to be the model that we draw upon in various ways throughout the course. So what I want to start with today is the model of communication. This is Roman Jakobson's model of communication. Roman Jakobson is a linguist. He was one of the foremost linguists of the 20th century. He's Russian. Uh, so we have a Russian theme going on already. The, the book, the textbook, is written by a Russian scholar who teaches at Eastern Washington University, Igor Kukana. Uh, so I'm going to go through this model and uh, try to elucidate how intercultural uh, relations can be built into this model. All right. So I'll be using some different examples. I'll be asking you for some different examples to help elucidate the model. Okay. All right. So. Uh, first of all, we have a definition. Who can uh, see the definition well enough to read it? Anybody? Who wants to read it? Do you want to read it? You see it? Do you want to use the microphone? Here. Here, I'll hold it. Communication. The address sends a message to the address To be operative, the message requires a context referred to. Sizable by the addressee and either verbal or capable of being verbalized. A code fully or at least partially common to the addresser and addressee. Or in other words, the and decoder of the message. And finally, a contact, a physical channel, and psychological connection between the addresser and the addressee enabling both of them to enter and stay in communication. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so this is a pretty standard uh, definition of communication, and he emphasizes addresser to addressee, but, but notice in the model, and there's a lot of models of communication that have arrows in them, right? But notice in this model there's no arrows. Any reason why you think there's no arrows in this model? He mentions in the definition that communication starts with an addresser. But why do you think there's no arrows? Anybody? Yes? Pardon me? That's right, absolutely right. Communication is not one sided, both the addresser and the addressee play a part in it. For there to be an addresser, what's presumed? There's an addressee, right? So I come into this class, you're the, my lecture, you know, in my lecture, you're the addressees. And you're a very particular group that compel a particular kind of discourse, of communication that I'm, that I'm expressing, okay? It's a very, you know, the setting, the, the addressees, um, the context, all of these things determine the discourse or the expression um, that the addresser provides. Right? So, um, also what else? All these things happen simultaneously. The message, the contact, the context, the code, all of these things are functioning at the same time, but we highlight some more than others in any particular instance of communication. All right. So let's start with the addresser and addressee and the functions that are associated with them. We have an addresser, and the function for the addresser is emotive. Now, this is not emotion, it's emotive. 
We can think of it as E dash moti. You've got to be motivated to speak, right? So E motive is related to motivation. But it also has an affective dimension to it. Okay? An affective. You have to have some drive, some passion. You have to care about what it is that you're talking about. We're not robots. We're not just spewing out information. We are not data banks when we speak, right? We are embodied agents. And we have agency, we have choices. So the emotive function suggests that our drives, our um, affects, our caring, all motivate us to speak, to engage in some form of communication. But it's not just speaking, is it? It's also gesturing, right? Gestures on people's faces, signs that people use. Peace sign in American culture, this means peace. In other cultures, not necessarily. Okay, thumbs up, okay. So any gesturing, is also expressive. So this is about expression. Right? So the addressee, the function, the associated function for the addressee is conative. Anybody know what that word means? Conative or conative? You're all paying attention. I mean, you know, most of you are paying attention. Um, so you're, you're oriented to, you're set towards my quote-unquote message, right? And because you're set towards it, you're oriented towards my speaking, you're valuing it in some way or not. So to the extent that you are valuing it and you're oriented to it, you're attending, you are processing, you are agreeing or disagreeing, you are determining whether or not it matches up with your values and your beliefs or your own experience. Right? So all of this is cognitive. Now, you know, I've used the example here, we have uh, like one to many form of communication or one to many level of communication. But, you know, this is true in interpersonal communication as well. And it's also true in intrapersonal communication. Right? You talk to yourself? Any, any of you talk to yourself? You talk to yourself? A little bit. It's, good. it's a good thing to do sometimes. Um, you know, when you think, you're thinking and listening to yourself, right? I'm, I'm listening to my speech right now. And because I'm on film and it's going to go up on a website, I'm, uh, you know, a little self-conscious about what I say. I doubt if I'm going to swear too much during this class. Right? It's okay. What do we do? We work within constraints and sometimes we censor ourselves before we speak. That's all intrapersonal communication. Intra. So we have intrapersonal communication. We have interpersonal, one-to-one. -one. We have group forms of communication of one to many or many to one. What's a situation in which there's a many to one communication? Can you think of any examples? Yeah. Can't hear you more, sorry. An intervention. An intervention? Okay, right. So so someone who's an addict, for example? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, someone who has an alcohol problem. And uh, a family gets together and decides to intervene as a many to one communication. It's an intervention. Or a good any question. other scenario where someone is worried about a family member or something. Right, any, anything like that. Yeah. Where, where there's a group that comes together to communicate to a single person. You're all, you're a group. This is a big group. We have over 100 people in here. Uh, you as a collective group are in some ways communicating to me. 
What about uh, traditions? Right? You, you grow up in a particular cultural world, social world, and traditions are expressed through that history, through those uh, you know, kind of collective forms about what is important, what you should value, what you should believe, how you should conduct yourself in certain situations, and, uh, and so on. Okay, so there's a many-to-one kind of communication. There's also a much broader form of communication that we call cultural generally, and the culture can include mass media forms of communication as well as traditions, okay, normative practices, and, uh, and so on. Okay, so the addresser-addressee relationship is very complex, but we engage in it, you know, in a, in a very uh, simple way, you know, or a very easy way on a daily basis. We don't really think about it too much. All right, let's talk about context, message, contact, and coding. Anybody have any questions about addresser or addressee kinds of relationships? Okay, you got it? All right, so let's talk about context. Context is referential. Context is referential. First, what's context? Context is, yeah. The topic that you're speaking about. Okay, it includes the topic, certainly does. All right, so, so the context is um, configured in part by the topic or the subject matter it that's can being addressed. It be what's going on in the world as someone is talking. Exactly, okay. Yeah. <coughs> All right, so previous knowledge that you bring to bear um, in any communication with someone else, that provides the context. What else? What other, are, what other elements of context? Yeah. The way the message is received by the addresser. Okay, so the perception of the addresser by the addressee based upon previous knowledge or experience or current feelings or attitudes um, uh, has a part to play in the context. What else? I saw some hands up over here. No? The setting, right? Yeah. Um, it'll be everything that's coming with the message, so it's oftentimes described as different points of noise. Okay, so there's uh, background noise, there's light, there, it's associated with the setting, right, or the environment that we're in. And this is a very different environment than a smaller classroom or a seminar room. <coughs> plays a part in how communication takes place. Now we have an additional element to the context here because we're videotaping it. So that's a, that affects my own expression. I walk outside of here, whoops, I'm out, I'm out of the camera. And my relationship with you has changed, right? It changing even more? Yeah? Yeah, a little bit, right? So, uh, you know, movement, motility, the relationship, bodily or corporeal relationship between people, we're going to talk about this in terms of contact in a minute, all plays a part in the context. So, context is referential. The idea here that Jakobsen is trying to express is that meaning sense, the sense of something, okay, what it refers to changes with the context. So what you say at one time in one place, you can repeat that at another time and another place, and the meaning is going to change. So referential essentially means changing, right? Uh, referential doesn't necessarily mean changing. I mean, I can refer to an object. Uh, this uh, podium, this desk, I'm referring to it. Okay? It's within your vision. But I can refer to abstract concepts too, like immigration or democracy or presidential candidates. Now, how do we address these different abstract concepts and their meanings and significance? are going to change depending upon the context in which they're uttered. Right? So when context shifts, meaning and significance shifts also. 
This is Jacobson's point. So meaning only exists within a context. And to get into the depth of the meaning requires more communication. Okay. Now, can context slip? Can meanings get distorted? You ever report what someone else has said to you? Or report what happened in a particular context outside of that context? Right? So when that happens, the context has slipped. This is one of the criticisms of Jacobson's notion of context. That it's not stable. Context is not stable. Okay, so what, what is said in one context like this one, and how that gets reported outside of this setting are different things. So the meanings shift with the change of context, even though the same thing is said. Is that, are you following me? Does that make sense? I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I, in another class, I give an obscenity lecture. I talk about the neurobiology of the obscene, using vulgarities, using swear words, and so on. All right? And I, and I tell the class before, before we start, listen, you're going to hear obscenities today. The F word, the S word, you know, swear words. And we're, because we're using them as examples of how obscenities work in everyday life between and among people. And if you don't want to hear the obscenities or if you're offended by them, you can you can leave. You don't have you're not required to be here for this course or for this class for the, that particular day. Now, I give the lecture and someone in the lecture takes offense to what I said. And they go out and they go to other people and say, you know what? Dr. Smith swears a lot in class. He's swearing all the time. He must have sworn a hundred times today in class. It was really, really terrible. I felt offended, and I'm going to file a harassment complaint. But what they didn't realize is that you said you were going to... That's right. It's a shift of context. It's a shift of context. We, we lost our image here, huh? All right, so context can shift. You know the rumor mill? You ever play the rumor mill? You whisper in somebody's ear and then it goes around the circle? It's another good example of how meanings change based upon what is what is heard. Like yeah. the game telephone? Yeah, like the game telephone, same thing. <coughs> Alright, so the message is poetic. This is a, a very important part of Jakobson's model, and it's an implicit critique of mathematical models of communication. Because mathematical models of communication use the terms sender and receiver, and the message then becomes information. All right? So mathematical models of communication, one example of that is Shannon and Weaver's model of communication. If any of you have taken other comm courses and studied models of communication, uh, Shannon and Weaver says sender, receiver, message is related to information, and then there's noise, and there's feedback, and so on. Jakobsen says that's very limited, because communication is not information alone. Certainly communication involves information, but there are other dimensions to the message that make a difference in understanding. All right, so the whole idea here is that we understand each other. All right, so um, really, we can look at this in a couple of different ways. When any individual speaks, he or she uses language that has uh, metaphors, <clears throat> metonyms, similes, irony, sarcasm, other what are called tropes, T-R-O-P-E-S, tropes. These are poetic devices. We use them all the time. Right? And you know, we don't aren't really aware of how difficult it is 
for someone who doesn't know your code or your language to understand your poetic communication. This is the most difficult part about learning another language, right? Because we speak in metaphors. And maybe those metaphors are not familiar to people from another culture who have a different language. They're studying English and they're learning the literal meanings of words. But then, come to find out, there's a lot of ways in which we use metaphors that aren't, you can't look them up in a dictionary, right? You're smiling, you seem to know what I'm talking about. Um, so, we use metaphors all the time. Okay? And that's poetic. And it affects, depending upon who it is you're speaking with, it affects their degree of understanding. Because right? we don't just, it's just not information, it's not literal meanings of words, it's connotating meanings of words that are poetic. Right? So the language use itself is poetic. That's why Jakobsen emphasizes this. But not only that, how we say something differs from how someone else says the same thing. Or how you say the same thing in a different context. The whole idea of shifting again in context. I'm going to give you an example. This is one of my favorite examples. All right? Here's, here's a simple phrase. You can come by my house. You can come by my house. What do I mean? Yeah, you can stop by. You can stop by and visit. Hey, you can come by my house. No problem. Any other meaning there? Any ambiguities? Yeah. You can go purchase the house. Either one. We recognize those ambiguities because we're native speakers of the English language and it, you know, we've acquired the capacity, as Noam Chomsky emphasizes in his Universal Grammar. Uh, we acquire the capacity to recognize those kinds of ambiguities. Right? So that's one level. But here's another level. You can come by my house. You can... Uh, you can come by my house. You can come by my uh, house. You can come by my house. The first one, or maybe also the last one, sounded like maybe um, what I would think of is if someone said, oh, I can't today, I'm busy. Like maybe the person saying, you're, you know, you're wrong. You can't. You have time. What are you talking about? Right. So you can you can get a sense of if someone is lying, for example, right, or deceiving you in some way. So what you know, how you speak makes a difference. The kinds of emphasis you place on words, your own gestural, you know. Forms, how you how you use your arm. I'm, I'm one arm here, you know, having to hold the mic. But how you express yourself, your facial expression, all of this comes into the understanding of the language used in the message and the interpretation of that language and that expression. Okay. So the messages are poetic, not just. Okay, let's talk about contact. Contact is bad. There's two dimensions of contact. Two dimensions of contact. One is physical, and the other is psychological. And we're going to talk about both of these dimensions in much more detail because they're really integral to intercultural contexts. Uh, when we say physical contact, the technical term that's associated with that, the term you'll find in the book, is proxemics. So your proximity to somebody else. Just a few minutes ago, I walked over here. I'll use you guys again as an example, right? So now we have a very good relationship. Tell me when you're uncomfortable. Are you okay? How about that? All right. No problem. Uh, people uh, have various degrees of comfort depending upon how far away they are from each other. And that's going to vary from one culture to the next. 
and not just national culture, also age plays a role in that, gender plays a role in that. You know, uh, you know, women maybe feel closer or feel more comfortable when they're closer together uh, than they are if they're with a man, if it's just a friend or especially a stranger. All right? In some cultures, people are really close. You know, in Arab culture, men get really close together. Men hold hands in the street. All right? Men kiss each other on both cheeks. Same in uh, Mediterranean cultures in Europe many other cultures uh, in, in the world. Right? So that kind of physical contact is a significant part of communication. Because if you transgress that norm in some way, the other person stops hearing what you're saying or what you're doing. Because they become anxious or uptight or uncomfortable in some, in some way. Okay, so contact is physical. And again, we'll talk about this in a lot more detail. Um, uh, when we get to nonverbal communication, the coming chapter. And it's also psychological. Contact is also psychological. That is, and the kinds of, ex of, of examples that Jakobsen gives are uh, phrases that we use to ensure that the other person is still listening. Or if the other person understands. I'll do this often throughout the class. I'll say, do you understand? All right, that's a that's a little phrase that is, uh, you know, intended to enhance contact. You know, we're still connected. Am I making sense? Do you get it? Have any questions? So, so these are these are uh, you know verbal forms of enhancing psychological contact. You know, psychological contact also comes to the forefront if you see somebody who makes you uncomfortable. You need any examples of this? There's been a number of instances of this of late. Of discomfort in a public context with significant ramifications, all based upon psychological responses to the presence of another person. Any, any examples? Follow the news at all? Yeah. How about Trump and Hillary having somebody on over the left of the shoulder? No, huh? What was that? Uh, basically, within a week, um, Hillary had somebody behind her that was. Oh, well, you gotta, you gotta watch this. You know, I screen all my people, and then, like the next day, he had somebody behind him. So that creates a psychological effect on the speaker, unless you didn't know. Yeah. It. But it's, it certainly it's creates a psychological effect sure. on the people who are viewing it. There's a really funny uh, video. I don't know if you've seen this. You know, the whole thing about building a wall. On, you know, it's a huge wall along the Mexico border. You know that, right? Already. And 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 uh, uh, a lot of it was built during. Um, George W. Bush's presidency. And did you ever see this video where, where he's inaugurating the wall? He's down there at a big press conference. And in the background, you see the wall. Did you see this picture? So it's, it's George W. Bush, and he's talking and saying, this wall is going to serve the purpose. And you know, all the cameras are there, and all the officials and border control, and everybody's all standing around. And he said, this is going to stop the flow. And in the background, what do you see? You see two guys climbing over the wall <laughs> and dropping down and taking it off. You ever seen this video? Oh, it's hilarious. You know? Yeah, this is going to stop. I mean, it's just, it's really, really, and it's not staged. It was a real event. There's all the border controls all standing around paying attention to the president and, and the cameras are on the president and behind him, like that. Not, very, not that far away. These two guys the wall. So that certainly affects the interpretation of the message. What's it do? It creates irony. That creates irony. It goes back to the message. 
and, and it undermines credibility at the same time. Yeah. You would think if the wall didn't work the first time, they wouldn't want to build another. <laughs> yeah, or if they'd have to build it higher and with more barbed wire or grazer wire or something like that. You know, walls is a, it's an interesting subject and uh, how nations attempt to secure their borders through, through walls and various other, other forms. Okay, so contact is psychological. Um, I was thinking also of a situation in which, you know, this is, this is a, a major problem for, uh, for people um, who are of Arab descent or appear to be Arab descent. They get on an airplane and they speak Arabic, right? What happens? Someone hears the Arabic and sees the people, and they freak out. And they say, I hear these people talking, they're talking about ISIS. And what happens? These innocent people get pulled off the plane, right? They get pulled off the plane. Just happened recently, it was in the news just last week. Three uh, siblings, uh, a brother, two sisters, flying from, I think, Heathrow Airport in London, uh, we're on the plane together, sitting together, talking, and they're British citizens. And they got pulled off the plane because someone who's sitting behind them complained to the, um, not to the pilot, but to the, the uh, attendant, the flight attendant, and, and she called, I guess, 911 or security or whatever, and they pulled them off the plane, and they, they delayed the plane for one hour. Everybody had to suffer as a result of this, uh, and uh, and they got interrogated on the tarmac outside the plane. I think they even pulled their luggage off the, you know, out of the luggage part. Contact. That psychological contact. All right. So, so uh, any other examples recently of, uh, of of you know gestures, messages sent. That are nonverbal, that have to do with contact? Anybody think of anything? Yeah? I just have a question. So, I guess I'm not understanding what the difference would be between you saying that this is psychological contact rather than context. Well, context plays a part. All of this is happening at once. Okay. You can't have contact that makes any sense unless the context is clear. Okay? So, so yeah, the context plays a huge part in it. Certainly if they were in a restaurant, perhaps, and the same people were involved, that, in what I just described, three people come in, and they're speaking Arabic, and they're sitting near someone else who hear, overhears their Arabic, chances are they're not gonna complain about it, right? It's the airplane that enhances the fear that's associated with that contact, okay? So what we're trying to show here is that all of this, um, I'll, I'll get it, all, all of this happens at the same time. You know, we, can, we differentiate it analytically in order to understand what's going on. So, any other examples? What about uh, Kaepernick's, uh, you know, we're going to think of, go ahead, go ahead. Um, well, uh, I guess we have a right in the United States not to stand up for the national anthem. So, I mean, he did, and I guess he was making a statement saying that, you know, he's being oppressed, and, you know, this country is going downhill. So, I mean, the 49ers fired him, but, I mean, I guess they it's fired him. Yeah, they did, they, they cut him. They cut Kaepernick? Yeah. When did that come out? Like two days ago, I guess. I think starting this San Diego, the San Diego game. Are you sure about that? Anybody else know we need verification here? No, it's <laughs> ridiculous. Because they're playing San Diego. I just heard on the radio this morning. They're playing in San Diego this morning. They're having a special military uh ceremony in san diego where they unfurl a flag the size of a football field and kaepernick has been interviewed and said he's not going to stand up this weekend either yeah you know about this uh i heard that 
Yeah. They talked about cutting him. It was like a big story. And then he like took a stand of like why he did it, and now they're not cutting him. Okay. I mean, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar came out in his defense, so you know. Yeah. Okay, so he did get cut, but then they reinstated me. Okay, yeah, I didn't see that. I heard that he did get cut. Yeah, I was like, we're good. Free you know, like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he's sending a message. It's poetic, right? He's just sitting down. Now, he's not making any statements, you know, or burning a flag or anything else other than what? That he opposes some of the oppression that's been taking place with minorities, especially African Americans in the United States. Yeah? Um, is it a cultural thing that you have to stand up? Yeah, it's cultural, absolutely. It's normative. Because if that's so offensive, then I would have been kicked out by the uh, <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Context makes a difference, right? Capability, context makes a huge difference. So you're not going to be, you know, not there's not going to be negative attention towards you when you don't stand up for the <coughs> national anthem, right? So context makes a big difference. All right, anything else? Yeah. Yeah, context that he's representing the team. Yeah, I mean the team. It's going to be interesting to see in the next if anybody joins him. Right, everybody's going to stay by himself, or if anybody joins him. Now, if, if I mean, I don't know how many African American uh, players are on the team, um, but if none of them join him, that's a statement too, isn't it? That's a statement. That's not the first time somebody has refused to stand up or in some way protested. Yeah, you got. No, Donald Trump. All right, Donald Trump goes to Mexico. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing the cartoon. <laughs> Donald Trump goes to Mexico. The Donald in Mexico. You're fired. He fires the president of Mexico. Rally TV. So, all right, so, so he travels to Mexico. There's a contact that is made, right, with the president of Mexico that he provides a photo walk for him and so on and so forth. But then the messages that come out of that meeting vary. They vary from Trump himself. And then they vary based upon the president of Mexico's response as well. Okay, so these are all touch upon content. So any part of this model, any element or function of this model, is going to have more salience than others depending upon, upon the situation, right? I mean, so, so this is the, the purpose of doing analysis of communication, is to take a look at these constructs and use them to analyze uh, different forms of communication like we're talking about right now. All right, the last element in code is, or last element of the model is code, which is metalinguistic. All right, we all operate according to codes, right? We have social codes. Kaepernick just violated one of the social codes, one of the normative codes of American citizens when the um, Star Spangled Banner is played. All right? So the code is that everybody stands up, at least stands up, right? That's the minimal. Everybody who's able to stand up. Everybody who's able to stand up stands up. Thank you. And some people put their hand over their heart. Right? Men are supposed to take off their hats. Right? How come women don't take off their hats? Huh? Are women supposed to take off their hats? Yeah. Because there's a double standard. Oh, there's a double standard. Yeah? I'm with you. Equality, right? <laughs> uh, and you're supposed to stand at attention. You know, you're not supposed to be chewing gum. I'm talking to your neighbor and that kind of stuff. All right, so that's a code. It's a social code. We operate according to social codes that are normative in our everyday lives. You think of other examples of social code? Social codes. Is there a social code taking place right now? Yeah. What who? Sitting down and paying attention. 
you do, you know something else, like what? Knitting? <laughs> Whatever else. Like right. not paying attention, but social code to pay attention to the professor. Exactly, that's right. So the social code is to come in and pay attention to the professor, not be a distract. I mean, I lay out the social codes in the syllabus, right? Here are the social codes. So these are normative kind of rules, or, you know, I like to use the term regularity of practice, that we quote unquote follow uh, given the situation and the context. Okay, so address terms, how you address each other, how you address someone of higher status, how you, you know, these are social codes. There's a number of ways that you can address me. You can, I mean, the normative mode, you know, is Dr. Smith, or Professor Smith, or Mr. Smith. These are all formal means of addressing me. Okay? Some people are comfortable with first names. So they'll say, can I call you Andrew? And I'll say, sure, you can call me Andrew. That's fine. So what's the assumption there? That there is some equality, right? Some uh, you know, friendly relationship and so on? What about Smith? Can I call you Smith? How are we doing there? That just sounds like the person is fed up with you. Like, hey. Hey, Smith, I need to talk to you. <laughs> My son texts me, hey, you going to be around tonight? I'll write back and say, hey, uh, I don't know. <coughs> my hey, is that my name? Hey? Well, in that context, hey is just like hi or... I know, you're right, because hey has changed its meaning, hasn't it? Hey is like hi, it's friendly. Like, my son doesn't get it, my son's 16. He's like, what do you mean? What's wrong with hey? You know, it's like, hello. Hey means hello. It's a connotation. I know, my generation was hey is a little, you know, it's hailing you. Right? Hey, you. Oh, sorry. Hey, you. Or you. So, um, you know, there's different codes that are associated with forms of uh, address and, and ways in which you make connections with someone. Yeah. There's also another context for the word hey, when someone insults you and you go hey, like when they insult you. Right, you can use hey in lots of different ways. Hey, what are you talking about? Okay, good. So codes, we operate by social codes. We're going to talk a lot about social and cultural codes. Um, learning the codes of another culture is extremely important during adaptation processes. What is appropriate in that cultural or sociocultural context? And knowing those contexts enable you to operate according to the accepted code. Now, usually people are generous in the mistakes that people from other cultures make in their um, interaction. Okay, but then it's more difficult in the United States. Because if someone operates according to a code that is considered non-normative, there can there can be feelings of affront or insult or you know uh, whatever. So you, you hear people say, "Hey, you're in America, speak English," and we'll we'll have the uh, what's the name? What is it? The uh, angry kebab woman. The, the angry kebab woman. Should we'll, I put it? Not now. Okay. We'll, we'll set it up. Okay. So we'll be watching a little uh, little YouTube video of the angry kebab woman. Uh, and and uh, you know, this, this helped illustrate this, this idea, you know, where, where this American woman attacks uh, merchants in a, um, in a restaurant because they're not speaking English. And she's affronted by that. It's very intense and a little funny. So, code is metalinguistic. Metalinguistic. Meta means above, okay, metaphysics. Meta analysis, meta language, meta communication, meta for, meta is above. What it means is that um, language is used to talk about language. 
We have communication about communication. So to the extent that the code can be discussed, like we've just been discussing it, we can recognize how it operates, we can develop our critical capacities, and we can argue to change, to change the code, right? I mean, one of you could have said on Tuesday when we went through the syllabus, hey, Dr. Smith, you know, I, I like asking questions about with my neighbor. You know, whoever I'm sitting next to, I, I don't hear really well, and I like to sit in the back of the room, so if I don't hear what you're saying, I want to I want to be able to talk to my neighbor, and you say that if I chit chat, that I'm going to lose points. That's not fair. I don't think that should happen. What is what's happening? You're challenging a part of the code, right? This is how things change. You challenge the code. What do what do others mean by their gestures, their forms of expression, and how they are um, interacting with you? Right? So this is extremely important in intercultural interaction. Why? Any ideas? Why is this so important? The ability to be able to language about language, communicate about communication. Well, for one thing, if there's a metaphor or an idiom, which is like a cultural expression, then you can maybe explain to someone from another culture and what it. Okay, exactly. Right. So you guess what? Well, we need to have communication about communication. One because, well, I mean, most fights happen due to misunderstandings. Right. So I mean, before you know what I mean. So before things just break down into like. Let's get some clarification yeah. before the blows start. Yeah. Right. And so that means, you know, I understood you to say this, which meant this. Is that what you meant? So we're, we're moving into a clarification of the meaning of what is said and whether it's, you know, it's degree of appropriateness or whatever the case may be at that, at that moment. Yeah. That's right. It's the only way to overcome barriers and to learn about the other culture and its language and expression, its norms, and, and everything else. It's exactly right. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes commitment to adapting to the other other culture. All right. Um, especially if your language ability in that cultural world is not really good, and the one you're talking with, their language ability. You know, with your language is not very good, then you spend a lot of time languaging about language. <clears throat> Get clear on what each other means. That's meta communication. Meta, meta language, meta linguistics, is how children learn language. So even saying what did you say is that is that like meta? Well, what you're what, asking what did you say is just asking to get clear on the message. Asking what does what you say reflect the university's policies? That's focusing on the code. You following me? Yeah. Okay. So so uh, there's a difference there. Okay, so the extent to which we can recognize the operation of different codes and negotiate those different codes between people of different backgrounds, social, cultural, ethnic, gender, age, all of it, the more enhanced the communication understanding becomes. All right, so meta language and meta communication is essential for deeper understanding, and it's essential for changing the rules. If you think a rule is not fair, you address the rule, you're talking about the rule, you're meta-communicating, it's meta-language. All right? Any questions about any of this? Let's go. Well, that's okay. We're done with the model. So we'll have to fix the, uh, 
uh, I guess, the time limit, right, or the limit on the visual. Okay, any questions about communication? <clears throat> All right, these last uh, 20, 30 minutes, we're going to, I guess it's about 25 minutes, we're going to talk about culture. Different conceptions of culture and the limitations and so on. So there's different conceptions of culture. We have historically, um, different conceptions, and then even in the contemporary life, the world, and you know, academic uh, fields, we have different conceptions of culture, so we've got to kind of get clear on what these different conceptions are. All right, so one of, the, one of the conceptions of culture, as I elaborated in those, is the classical conception of culture. What's the classical conception of culture? Yes. Okay, that's a little bit more on the relative, that's more of a relativist notion of culture. The classical is linked a little bit more to aristocracy. You're, you're cultured or you're not. Okay, so usually that's related to education and also what strata of society you're born into. That's the classical conception of culture. You're cultured because you can play music, or you can appreciate art, or you can you have money, you have status, you're part of the arist arist aristocracy. That's a classical conception of culture, and that's not the conception of culture that we're going to be addressing or using in this class. Okay? Another notion of culture is evolutionary. The evolutionary notion of culture. What's that? Anybody have any ideas? How culture changes over time and how, for instance, maybe technology gets incorporated into Okay, but technology certainly plays a role in the development of culture. It certainly does. Um, and how culture changes over time is exactly what evolutionary notion is, but there's usually a value associated with that. What is it? Yeah. Because it's usually um, kind of the value of a certain environment being able to create something unique. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Any ideas? Evolutionary notion of culture. Yeah. All right, so the idea of savages and the civilized. This is a, you know, almost, you know, uh, classical quote-unquote notion of evolutionary differences between cultures. That that there's a scale of cultural development. This is the evolutionary notion. Some are higher, and others are lower. And because the evolutionary notion of culture was developed by Western anthropologists, French and American, guess who's at the top of that? And who's at the lower end? So it's a way of creating a hierarchy of cultures that are more or less civilized, okay? And some that are just savage. We use, you know, uh, you know, this idea of the, of, of the primitive, which is low on the evolutionary scale. Now, Claude Levi-Strauss, Levi -Strauss, other anthropologists drew upon this evolutionary notion, but actually um, contested it in some ways, because they showed how cultures that are considered primitive or savage actually are very complex. They have complex languages, they have complex kinship systems. They have, they have a complexity that Western societies typically don't recognize or know. Okay? So, um, the evolutionary notion of culture is problematical. And the classical notion of, and it's linked up to the classical notion in some ways. Uh, so, we have to be very, very careful. 
You know, what's the standard that's being used to judge the cultural group? That's the question you have to ask. Right? And what are the presumptions of people from other cultures with regard to their judgments of those who are different? So we have to be very careful with the evolutionary notion of culture. You know, it's linked to development and colonial colonialization, colonization. You know, Western Europe, mostly Western Europe, not just Western Europe, Russia as well, some Asian uh, national cultures as well, colonized uh, people in the developing world, and uh, with mixed results. Many of the wars that we see now that are taking place in the world, if you, if you follow those back far enough, you'll see that they're probably linked to colonial occupation of that country by France, by Great Britain, by Italy, by Holland, by the Dutch, the Netherlands, by the Portuguese, uh, and so on. Okay, uh, so uh, this is this is problematical, and we see whenever there's intervention, we're going to come in and we're going to enhance your society. All kinds of violence result over time. Okay, so then there's a third notion of culture that you need to be aware of. And we're going to talk more about this uh, later on, and it has it has more positive aspects than the other two, and it's the relativist notion of culture. The relativist notion. What's the relativist notion of culture? Anybody? It's similar to what you were saying before. Anybody? Yeah. Um, the notion that it's not the economy or the culture that civilization is like every every bit of culture has um, something good that can be taken from it or something good that can be Okay, so um, every culture has something good that can be taken from it and something you know or problematical, but who am I to judge? Right? So the relativist notion of culture takes issue with an ethnocentric attitude. That is, using the standards of your own culture to judge another one. And we're going to talk about ethnocentrism in several different ways in some coming chapters. Uh, so we'll hold off on that, but this is the relativist notion. The idea is that you need to respect, kind of moral and political respect, for how other cultures organize themselves, how they believe, what they value, what their practices are, and so on. All right, so, so the extreme form of the relativist view of culture is that cultures are morally equal. And that one culture should not impose its standards and values and beliefs and practices on another one. That's a relativist notion of culture. Is this is this a good thing? What do you think? Are you problems with this? Yes. I um, no, I wait, no. She wants it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, it's just really common for like people in the United States to see um, how like women especially are treated in like the Middle East. And then they'll try to compare how we treat how we're supposed to treat women here compared to the rights there. And there's some people who um, our culture relativists that like agree with that, and then there are some people who think that you know, each, like we said, each culture has their own, and you should impose your views on someone else. So it's a very common like argument. Okay, good. It's a very, very good point and important one because the idea here, you said Middle East. Let's just take Saudi Arabia for yeah. example, uh, where women have to be completely covered when they go out into the public, and if they're not, they're whipped their legs. If they show a leg, then you know, you know, they get they get punished. Physical harm. They can even get arrested. Um, yeah, go ahead. I don't know. Um, back home it just caused a lot of problems. Back home is where? Germany. In Germany. We have a lot of traditional friends and yes. a lot of times the women have to stay home. They don't learn the German language because they don't have the chance to. And um, they don't really want to adapt to German. I don't know, standards or like right. So they stay within their own enclave, speak their own language, have their own practices, and there's no 
not a lot of, so there's some though. I mean, some who do adapt and others who yeah. don't, right? So there's more that are conservative and want to stay within that conservative <coughs> kind of realm. Uh, but others break out, right? I mean, it's, it's not wholesale. Yeah. Right, it's typically the case. So this is a very, very good example. So, so we have clashes of cultural norms and cultural values, uh, and judgments are made. There's expectations that if they're going to be in Germany or in Europe, anywhere, uh, these immigrants, they need to adapt to that society. It's not to say that you have to reject your traditions and, and your practices, but you know there needs to be some effort to adapt. If you learn the language, you need to be able to be educated, be part of the educational system, integrate into the society, um, enable women, uh, especially, to become full-fledged citizens and members of the community, and so on. All right? That's a judgment. That's an expectation. Now, there's another level to this, too. Because we're thinking in terms of national cultures that are setting the standards for expectations of women, how they dress, how they, how they express themselves, their access to resources, symbolic resources, as well as other resources, education, and so on. But what's the overarching <laughs> cultural force at work here that transcends all cultures. There's a word for it. And you see it in many religions and many cultures. It's called patriarchy. Patriarchy is operating in many, many cultures in the world. The idea that men are superior to women in a variety of different ways. Patriarchy is still operating in the United States. How? Pardon? Okay, so of course, in, in education, we have the Title IX, uh, which has demanded that that there's equality between the sexes in terms of sports and, and other means, but. Women soccer players aren't getting paid, right? The big salaries that, that male soccer players get paid. The other examples in the United States of patriarchy operating, yeah. What do you get paid? How much? I think it's more than that. Anybody know? On the dollar. Yeah. It's 73 cents to the dollar in most professions that women get paid compared to men. What's up with that? Can we judge that? We can make a judgment on that, can't we? So this is the problem with relativist view. It presumes that judgment is not appropriate, that you can't be critical of other people's practices, other quote-unquote cultural groups' practices. There's other issues related to this, but, but this is a problem. And also, it doesn't recognize that there are cultural forces that are transcultural. Okay? There are forces that are transcultural. Patriarchy is one of them. Patriarchy is one of them. So if you're critiquing another culture and it's repression of women, the focus of the critique should come at patriarchy. You know, there's a Saudi, just one, just one second, there's a Saudi uh, minister who came forward and said, hey, he was not just an minister, he was also an imam, I believe. And he, and he came, he made, this is really radical in Saudi Arabia, he said, look, I've read the Quran, I've read the life of uh, the prophet, um, I, I know all about uh, his, his wife, Khadija, and his daughter, Aisha. Aisha was a general, she led battle, she fought in wars. They didn't cover their hair in Muhammad's time. Muhammad never said anything about women being covered. These are folk ways of Saudi culture, he said. It has nothing to do with religion. He's right. 
He's absolutely right. Aisha was a warrior. She had an army of thousands. Khadija selected Muhammad as her husband. He was her employee. Did you know that? She was older than him. She was his boss. We don't hear about this too much, right? So this minister in Saudi Arabia raised these issues and is being roundly criticized by the rulers of Saudi Arabia, right? But the point is, he's absolutely right. These are folkways. This has nothing to do with religion, but what's happened is the patriarchy of Saudi Arabia has taken those folkways and linked them to Islam in order to maintain their power. And we can critique this, no matter where you're from. So relativism has its values, but it also has its limitations. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she was a merchant. She was a merchant. She, you know, controlled caravans and trade and so on. So. But she did. I mean, she did have that power, right? And, yeah. and, and, and uh, you know, this was before Islam was established. And Muhammad was married to her. He was he and she were husband and wife. It was the only wife he had until she died. So, you know, this idea of polygamy came kind of post Khadijah's death uh, with regard to, to Islam. And there's other historical reasons for that as well. Okay, so we have these different cultural notions that are associated with oftentimes anthropological work that we have to um, both understand and appreciate, but also um, critique and right, recognize their, their limitations. Okay, so there's, a, there's another conception of culture that I have in my notes that you, you might have access to. It's on page two of the notes. And this is a notion of culture that comes from a fellow named Schwartz. So I'm gonna read it to you. Uh, culture consists of the derivatives of experience, more or less organized, learned or created by the individuals of a population, you could say, or you know, of, of groups or collectivity, including those images or encodements, coding processes, and their interpretations or meanings that are transmitted from past generations, from contemporaries, people of our own time or formed by individuals ourselves. Okay? So, these are important concepts. That it's part of experience. Culture is part of our experience. Culture is not out there. Culture is not custom. You know, customs and, and, and folk ways and practices are part of culture, but they're not equivalent to culture. Culture is a form of embodiment. Right? We embody practices, values, ideas, conceptions, and so on, based upon our experience and the experience of our parents and the social world around us that guide us to be successful in, in, our, in our lives, in our, in our societies, in our communities, and so on and so forth. Okay? So our attitude towards time is cultural. Our conception of time our conception of space, language and language use, it's some, you know, it's gendered in some cultures, certainly more than in English, okay? So, um, you know, that's cultural. How we develop relationships with whom is cultural. We don't go to our culture book and, and, and figure this out. We embody it, it becomes part of our everyday lives. It's, it's reflexive. It becomes intuitive. So culture is linked directly to uh, experience. Also, it's got to be coherent. It has to make sense. It has to be internally consistent and sustained over time. Some, some might say it has to be replicable. I mean, more you know, people within that group or community all have to adhere to 
and similar kinds of practices and values, whether it's a national culture or a corporation. But this definition also suggests that people can create their own culture, right? It starts with two people and then expands. The extreme form of this is a cult, right? You see cults develop their own kinds of practices. Okay, there's um, also a difference between generic and local cultures that's elaborated in the notes, so make sure that you take a look at that. We'll come back to that in a, in a bit. In generic culture refers to what we all share as human beings. All right, so we have a culture as human beings that's different than the culture of uh, animals, and specific animals, bird species, which is not to say that they don't communicate or have language or have complex systems of interaction, and they do, but it's different, okay? And I want to end um, the class in the last three minutes that we have here with some of the common assumptions about coherence and the locus of culture. This is at the very end of the notes that are posted on D2L. One is that one of the assumptions is that culture is homogenous. It's not. Everybody who's a member of a particular cultural group doesn't have to be the same. We incorporate it and we embody it differently, even though we may share common values and practices. Another is that culture, another assumption is that culture is a thing out there in the world. As I just mentioned a few minutes ago, it's not. Right? It's internalized socialized, part of our, what we consider to be our nature, but is actually part of our cultural dispositions, the way we position ourselves uh, in the world. Another false assumption is that culture is uniformly distributed among members of a group. It's not. People assimilate culture differently. If you have siblings uh, and you have practiced a religion, you know that some, some of your siblings are more religious than others. Raised in the same household, has the same values, but has assimilated that religion in different ways. Another assumption that is wrong is that an individual has just one culture. And we don't, as the uh, workshop you're going to be doing next week uh, emphasizes. Right? We are each multicultural. I also uh, mentioned already that, that culture is not custom. And also, you know, culture is not timeless. Culture changes. I mentioned this last time as well, that uh, culture, I use the sexual metaphor here, that culture is promiscuous. It changes. It changes through internal critique of the members of the culture, and it changes through contact with other cultures. And we can look at this in lots of different ways, in terms of practices that cultures engage in, but also in terms of art forms music, art, uh, and so on. Okay, that's it for today. We're going to do our multicultural workshop next time. So come ready to engage in that. Have a good evening.